Um, there are bugs and worms in real soil, um, and soil is a habitat and really disturbance is not appreciated. Now, I tell you that and I know that I'm in potato country, um, you know, so we, we spent one night at the Great Sand Dunes just because we wanted to see something that was unique here. And then, you know, my husband and I are looking and I go, wow, that's a lot of soil erosion. <laughs> uh, and we can see why, and you know, you can understand how sand separates out and things like that, but I mean, it's building. Those dunes aren't just shifting, they're actually building, and you can see them expanding, and that's kind of a scary thing. Um, and if you don't think your soil is alive, then, you know, have a look at these things. I am really lucky that um, I had a technician when I worked for Ag Canada that uh, did all this, did these really amazing um, scanning electron micrographs so that we could see what these things look up, like up close and in person. And the thing that's really cool about this now, and I tell people this just from a trivial standpoint, is that we can actually put little tiny sensor, nano sensors, on the backs of these things and then actually understand that they, they all have unique vibrations and that's how they talk to one another and that's how they know what's a predator and what isn't. I mean, there's also a very new paper out that um, actually talks about how nematodes can actually smell bacteria and other things that actually prey on them and they particularly stay away from them. So it's, I mean, what we're learning with nanotechnology now is just unbelievable. Uh, this is, of course, what we want to look at. Now, we were over at the composters the other day, the vermicomposters, composters, and um, these, or these lovely orange bands that you see here mean that these earthworms are sexy, um, and you can see that they've been producing cocoons as well, so that tells us a whole lot about it. The reason I bring this in is because this is what soil that's really healthy should look like. You can see the channels. You see how it has that mottled look? It's not smooth. It's very mottled. There's a lot of different aggregates going on in here. You can see that this whole soil has been worked by earthworms. Um, ultimately, that's what we want to look for. Um, and, and, you know, the beautiful thing about having the cover crops in your system where you have potatoes and cover crops, potatoes and cover crops, is that we have one year where we get the diversity, we get the no-till, we get the, the habitat being built up again. So we allow for some of these things to maintain populations. I like to say, if you build it. Now, what's happening here? Yeah, we are. We're actually planting corn into a cover crop, as is. And that cover crop is going to be sprayed out after. So what we are doing here, this is um, David Brandt's farm in Ohio. And what we do is we plant directly into the cover crops and then spray them out after. If we had dual operation, we would do it all at once um, because that corn is going to emerge later. But it's just, it's easier to cut through green than it ever is to cut through when it's dry. So that's why we're using green. We're cutting through green. Um, you can build it with different technology too. Um, this is a, you know, the folks that I was with in Tanzania were really proud of this brand new no-till cedar that they had. Um, and we were cutting through green stuff, um, you know, with these oxen. So you, there's a lot of different ways that we can do this. It's not about always about the technology, although we're really lucky here that we have this amazing technology that now allows us to do a lot of the things that we want to. So if you build it, they will come, but it will take time and management. There's no way around that. This is, you, do, there, you have to put the time into the management. Every time you add something extra or you take on something else, it's a shift away from some things and a, and a shift into others. Um, you know, a, a lot of people like, you know, we hear a lot about Gabe Brown. Well, there's a lot of farmers right now that are looking seriously at how can I do things more efficiently so I don't have to spend so much time on my tractor, so I can spend a little bit more time at home, so I can think about things more, so I can walk away and just let my system do what it needs to do for itself. Um, and ultimately, that, that's what I'm working towards a little bit more. So I want to take advantage of these guys. Um, this, is, this is a handful of no-till soil. Now, when I was working at the Lethbridge Agricultural Research Center um, for Ag Canada in Lethbridge, Alberta, which is in the southeast, sort of south central corner of uh, Alberta, just about three hours north of Great Falls, Montana, um, this is a handful of no-till soil. 
that had been 40 years in no-till. And you can see that that soil was just going crazy. I mean, it was alive, it was working. Um, and that's where we first started to understand what no-till was doing for our soils and what reduced disturbance was doing. This is the cover. Uh, this has been on the cover of Farm Journal. This is by far the mite that gets the most press. Um, but you can see, look at this mouth here. It, I mean, this thing can go through anything. I mean, it's like a little tank and it's just chewing things up. They can chew each other. They can killing things. I mean, uh, these things, but you notice there's no eyes because they're just sensing vibrations. Now, all these soil animals are living in the top three inches of your soil because they're living on that residue that you're putting on the top. They're not living around the roots necessarily, they're just living in that top bit. And they're what are the interface between the soil and the residues you put on the surface. They're chewing out the inside. So you know how you see leaves on the ground and you just see the veins left? That's columbolins and mites and they've just chewed out the inside and then they've left the rest of it. Now, what's going to break down your woody stuff? Fungi. If you don't have fungi, you're just not going to break down the woody stuff. And so I hear people all the time go, oh, I can't do this. I'm like, it just never breaks down. Um, and, and you're like, well, you have a residue problem, really? And if you have a bad residue problem, you have one of two things happening. You have no biological activity in your soil or very limited biological activity of your soil, or you're growing BT corn, one or the other. Um, and so we, you know, now, I put this series in, this is from Switzerland. Um, and so the climate, a uh, little bit wetter than what you have here, but elevation-wise, very similar. Um, this was a case of, there's no way I can have mulch with my potatoes. It doesn't work, and it's not going to help, and it's going to be a mess. Okay, well, here we go. You can see the phases. You can actually see we're growing mustard. You can see the mustard in the background. Um, that's next year's plot. Um, here we have the mulch, we mulched it, the mustard, and we have the no mulch. You can see already that we have, we're, we're having soil erosion already. And if it were here, we'd be building up the sand dunes. And you can see, here we are. And you can see that those mulched potatoes look really sick. And, you know, and when we first did this, everybody, all the farmers were walking, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I told you, yeah, 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 yeah. you're going to spail. Okay, now you can see that with our mulch and the no mulch, we still, we still got a bit of erosion, but we've got the mulch in there, we're building things. Now here's the potatoes. Can you tell the difference between the fields by looking at them? Nope. There you are, side by side, mulch and no mulch. No, they actually, okay, so how we did it, we actually seeded the mustard. So we had like, it was more like a, a Brendan Rocky system where we had um, the mustard growing for one year and then we mulched it and made our hills, left it over and then put the seed, then, then put the potatoes in. Um, so very similar to what he's doing. Instead of a cover crop year, we just had a mustard year. And that's how we started. We were monoculturing. I mean, we don't do that now, but we started that way. Um, now, what's really interesting about this is that we used 18% less fungicide on this side than we did on the other side. So already, the first year, we were down on the chemical use, which was really exciting for all of us. And I mean, 18% doesn't sound like much, but it was huge um, to just even get down at all. That's what the potatoes looked like under the hill. We didn't have, we really weren't looking at scab. You can see that we had one scab here, a little bit of discoloration of blemish on there, but um, we actually out yielded on our mulch crop, even though the potatoes looked like crap early on, we actually out yielded on the mulch side than we did on the non-mulch side. Um, so, and we had fewer diseases and we had a lot of things. So the mulching, you know, the system that you're using right now, Brendan, this, I mean, this mimics it. Um, what we have now in Switzerland on this particular farm um, is a whole lot more mulch growing, a whole lot of using, actually they've got a 25 species mulch that they're using on the potatoes in between. Um, now you have to remember we're in Europe, 
things are, there's different price structures there. <laughs> do, they use, do they use anything growing in with the potatoes? No. During potatoes? No, they don't. But they're using everything, so they're using that in between time, the year off, to actually grow things that, um, and the whole idea there was to um, re, sort of reboot the system if you want, um, and give it more resilience and resistance so we come into the potato year. Because, I mean, they, otherwise they were doing potatoes, 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 and they wondered why there was, like, the Irish famine. I mean, it's like, come on, guys. So the idea was is that we could make their cover, if we could make the potatoes yield more and we could use less chemical the next year, et cetera, and, ha and increase their bottom line, like create, put, put more money in their pocket, then they were willing to take the year off to just build their soils in order to have the more yield and the better production and the higher quality in the next year. So that's how we got around it. So they had a, a high value potato potential. Yeah. And, then they and they were also looking for the potential to go organic because if they could eventually go organic, then they, the value was even higher for them. And so, I mean, it was all about money, which is fine. Um, you know, it's just about us as scientists putting our money where they're you know, our mouths where the money is, if you want to put it that way. And that, and I don't want to no, go ahead. In that picture of residue, Chad. Let me go back then. If you remember what that would have been, what would have been in that mix? In this case, we were just mustard. Just mustard. So just that mustard. That we residue. had three varieties of mustards. That much residue was left at harvest time. So if we go back. That's where we started with. You can see, and you can see the mustard growing for the next year. So you can see that. And then, and then you know, we actually maintained because this is a dry environment. I mean, this isn't even irrigated. So you can see that we were still mulching. Now I have to say that we've been mulching every second year for three years at this time because the system just got better and better and better. Um, now, and but we knew we had to shift from the, the mustard mulch. I mean, we we're doing things that you and I have talked about with nematodes and that, that's part of the mustard in there. Okay, so we wanna, you're feeding your below ground partners a, a nutritious diet. So that's your above ground livestock, your below ground livestock. Soil organic matter is the primary food source. Um, we know it's what drives nutrient cycling. We were saying 20 to 30 to 1. We've changed to about 50 to 1 um, because what I'm finding with is these mixes is that um, if we get to 20 to 31 in our mix, and that stuff is disappearing like that, I mean, we cannot maintain it. So we're upping it to about 50 to 1, getting enough carbon in there so that we keep the residue on the soil surface. Um, all of you know about this. This is the key thing that we're going to talk about. It's not just about water holding capacity, it's also about the fact that you have cation exchange capacity. So that means that actually the fertilizer that you're gonna use, or you're gonna augment your biological fertility with chemical fertility is gonna be more efficient and effective because we have better cation exchange capacity, we have higher water holding capacity, all those things are gonna be improved. Um, just an idea of what, you know, if you could actually filter off the larger organic matter, this is what it would look like. The really effective organic matter we can't see because it's actually, in um, molecular form. Okay, so the more mulch you have in the soil speeds up your biomechanical. This is the number here. It actually reduces, depending on how much you have, it will actually reduce evaporation from 5 to 27 percent. Um, you keep the soil cool so you keep your plants alive and it helps improve water infiltration. And you're going to see a bunch of slides you've just seen. <laughs> um, this is really old data, but it holds true for today. So this is the one that you were looking for. Um, so what it says here is 70, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is about 20 degrees, somewhere around 20 degrees Celsius, is perfect. This is your perfect temperature. Once we start getting up into hundreds, you start to see that we're getting into that really, that zone where you're getting down in your moisture use efficiency, your plants are struggling, the organism is struggling, um, once you get past, really, I like to say, once if you're starting, if you're getting past that 100 degrees, which we are going to get it past occasionally, once we get to 110, we're struggling big time. And you get to 120, and just assume that you've autoclaved everything, which is right here. It's done. 140 degrees, and we're baked. 
Now, the good news is, is that if this can happen gradually, which it does because I've insulated the soil with the residues, then it gives a chance for everything to go down. And they're going to get away from the surface. They're all going to go down. They're going to go to a place in the soil where it's, the temperature is much better, and they're all going to live there. The bacteria, as we go this way, are all going to insist themselves, and they're going to go into torpor as well. So we haven't autoclaved anything. The problem becomes with bare soil, where the temperature change, instead of doing this, and it's all modulated, it does this. I mean, we don't function well. People get sick when this starts happening. Animals get sick when this happens. Your soil gets sick when you start to have these big cycles. You don't want to have these big cycles. You need to have small cycles. You want to have, a, you, if we could, we'd want a flat line. But we know we're going to get some cycles, so we just want to, we want to minimize the amplitude of the wave between the soil temperature. And we also, the one thing you have to understand here too, is that we start irrigating at 100 degrees, a lot of people are. That even makes the soil hotter because that water gets into that soil and soil temperature interaction, and we start to have even hotter stuff. So that, are these temperatures surface temperatures? Uh, and these sur these temperatures are the top six inches, top four inches. Sorry. And you've just seen these, so I'm not going to go through them. This is from Burley County. So can we control runoff with organic matter? 2% organic matter hold 32,000 gallons of water. 21% of a 5.5 inch rainfall. Now, so we talked a little, you know, we kind of went through, so I'm just going to keep them all up there. The point is here, oops, go back. The point here is, is that for every even fraction of organic matter we build, and I'm not talking about the big stuff, we're going to have more water holding capacity. And that's what we need to do. When we are in a dry environment, we need to hold on to everything we've got. And that no-till year, the one that we're planting our cover crop or we're planting our wheat or we're planting whatever we are in between, is going to be the year where we build our soil moisture, where we build the recharge capability so that every darn drop of snow, every bit of rain goes right into that soil and we're holding it. Right now, I mean, I look outside and I see everything plowed down and I know that we need to get ready for spring. But we haven't got anything standing to catch anything. And, in a, and when we're in a really dry environment, we don't produce enough biomass in the first place to allow that not to catch. So we need to, have, we need to be trying to catch stuff. Most of you saw food web is running off root exudates. It's not running above, above ground. We focus on above ground. Everybody's like, oh, I can see. But we can see that, right? We can't see what's below ground. Most of the most stable organic matter that we have is below ground. David Tillman did some beautiful work on grasslands and actually extended that into agricultural systems. The reason why our multi-species works is because it gives you stability. The more roots and more different roots you have in the soil, the more stable your environment is, the more resistance and resilience you have for coming for the next system. We start to have soil carbon from the roots when it's retained. You know, we start to see more aggregates being formed. There's your mycorrhiza coming in, your glomalin. Roots normally account for 10 to 20 percent of the total plant root weight. So that gives you an idea of what biomass. Look at this. 52 percent of the, my, of the microbial biomass is seed. We need that soil biology because that's what's stabilizing our soil. That's what's giving us our holder capacity. That's what's giving our, our cation exchange capacity is that carbon. So what I like to do is I like the growers that I work with to measure organic carbon. I don't like to see organic matter numbers because I want to know what the organic carbon is. That's your Rick Haney tests. You've all heard, have, uh, most of you heard of the Rick Haney test? Okay, so those are your Rick Haney tests where you're actually looking at organic carbon because a lot of the organic matter, well, we can't see. So now we're getting closer to the root exudates. We're getting closer to what's actually being left in the soil and that's the kind of thing that we want to do. So I thought that this was just an amazing little statistic. Um, and it's true for all plants, that you get more out of your roots than you ever get from above ground. So let's use the roots more efficiently. Um, I stress predator-prey relationships, and that's all about soil structure. When we have good soil structure, we have better predator-prey relationships, which means I recycle things better. Because I have seen, I have a grower 
in Idaho that has one milligram of microbial biomass for every gram of soil. That's huge. But he has no predators because we've got a compaction problem because we've been getting on the ground earlier because it's been wet in the spring. And so now we had compaction and we didn't have any predators to eat up all that soil and microbial biomass, which meant that his microbes were actually competing against his plants. And they were way better competitors than the plants could ever be. So what it meant was that the plant, the microbes were actually holding all the nutrients, and because we didn't have any predators, we weren't recycling them. And we weren't getting taking advantage of that 52% of carbon that's coming from our microbial biomass. What we're doing when we do tillage, what we're really doing is wiping everything out from here over. That's why we need to build the organic matter, because when we have more organic matter in our soils, we have that cover crop. We allow, it's like a refuge for everything so that they get built up even though they get taken out the next year. And that's what we want to do. We want to keep building and building and having something in there. So we create these little islands of refuge in amongst our hill so that the, it, it keeps functioning. So we're looking at this model. This is our soil health. Here, here's our soil health. Our biological is really uniting the chemical and the physical properties of the soil. This is what we want to focus on here, soil productivity. What's your food quality like? Are your potatoes any good for me? Or are they just a bunch of calories? I want to know. If I were a livestock farmer, you'd know everything that went into your cows. You'd be knowing whether this was a quality feed or not. And yet half of us are feeding ourselves rubbish. That's no good. Let's make sure that everything goes into the food so nothing goes here, and then that creates a better health for all of us. That's the model that we need to work from, in my view. I put up Gaia Theory, and I had a lot of people, oh, this was great. We were at the AIM Symposium at, in, at No Till in the Plains, which is after the No Till in the Plains conference, and I had a couple of people, that's debunked, you know, that Gaia Theory is rubbish and whatnot. And I said, I don't really care. The point is that the point of this is, is that it, tells, it talks about connectedness so that we get an understanding of everything that we do is connected to something else. And so that when I, when I impose one thing on my system, then it's going to have consequences for some other things or it's going to build other things and every different plant I put in the ground is going to create its own network. I want that. So let's get to the root of soil health. Here's David Brandt having, a, you can see all his radishes out there. Um, and we want to get to the roots of this. We want roots that are, it's, it's about the below ground canopy. It's not about what's above ground. All these different roots. Persian clover, very, very drought tolerant. Woolly pod vetch, very drought tolerant. Very different root system. This has got more of a tap root, large, bigger roots. This one's got a lot of fine roots. Here's sun hemp with the big ball of nitrogen fixing. I like fava beans as well. Fava beans love it cool and wet in the spring, but take the heat. Um, you know, it's one of those things. We, we're going to use a little bit more of this. This is the kind of thing that you want to look at. When you're creating a cover crop, you want to have all these root types in there so that you're, you're filling the profile, the soil profile with roots. That's got to be our goal. It's not so much about what's above ground. We need that too, but it, we, we need to balance above ground with below ground. If we want to bring in pollinators, then we need some of these guys with the flowers on it too. We need to have both. And we need to be digging more pits. We need to be looking at, well, what does our cover crop really look like below ground? Look at how we're starting to change things. We've got actually this carbon streaking down. We're going to fill, now we, what we want is that whole profile to be black, not just that A horizon. We want to get more going on below ground. Um, this was first done by Stadelmacher, um, but Marshner in, in, um, her, in her, her book that she's revamped from her father, um, she talks about, she shows this graph again. 20 degrees C is your 70 degree mark. 68 degrees, 70 degrees. Look at the roots on them. You see 25, we're starting not, not so much. 15 is pretty good. So in our colder climates, we want to keep our soil 
that's why that cover crop is important because we're going to maintain our soil temperature a little bit better. We're going to have better rooting. Now, if I'm growing tubers, I want that better rooting. I mean, that's what I want. Can you go back to the, yep. the idea of, of uh, mulches and potatoes? So you had that mulch hill, yep. but it didn't necessarily have an enormous amount of cover. How does that relate to this? Because we still had, we still were moderating the soil temperatures. So we were maintaining lower soil temperatures in the heat of the day. Um, we were maintaining e more even temperatures, so we didn't have the amplitude of temperature change that we did in the other. So even though you don't have that complete cover, you think a lot of that is even just the color of the mulch versus the color of the soil sure. activity? Sure. Right, because you know, the darker that soil is, the more, the more heat I'm gathering. Um, the other thing is, is that I'm still holding on to water a little bit with that mulch, even though it wasn't outstanding. Um, the other thing is, is that I'm, I'm still armoring my soil or insulating my soil against some of these big temperature fluctuations, which is what I want. I think there's, there's got to be something more to it. Commonly, crop farmers will have a barley field that they just take the grain off and then they incorporate all the rest of the residues. So it's much like you know, a cover crop where you take sort of Sudan and incorporate all that back in. So all that carbon went back in the system. Yep. What we haven't seen a lot of farms, this big boost in soil health just because we put the carbon back in. No, and you don't see it just because you put it back in. Because it's not just about the big carbon. We're forgetting the nitrogen. This is where I think that our mixes are getting, are, we're, we're having the carbon and the nitrogen, and we're having, the other thing we're having is because we've got some brassicas in there, we're having some of these other allele chemicals that are sort of coming together. Brendan's got us. The difference we saw there, because we, we always had trouble following barley crop too, and I think what happens is you take that such a high CN ratio that you incorporate it into the soil, you get such a high input of carbon all once versus the grain manures where you got the balance between the CN and it allows it to break down. So I think that's kind of what the, you're talking about. Yeah. The other thing is, is so you of get, if we could find a way to leave all that residue on top of you, if there's some way to I have, wouldn't, crop, have a potato plant and they were all that residue on top of it, it would be a lot that better. Story, I still don't know how we. Yeah, I know. We had that whole conversation is how do we deal with that. But you know, the thing about that is, and the one thing with tillage, and you're incorporating just all that carbon, I mean, I can tell you right now that that kind of carbon does not stimulate a whole bunch of microbial activity. You get a lot of bacteria and stuff, but I mean, they, I mean, that's like feeding the whole audience here, asking them to exist only on candy. I mean, can't do it. You need the nitrogen, you need the micronutrients, you need some of these other things. And that's where that mix cover comes in, because then I'm going to take some of these other plants and I'm going to add the nitrogen from the nitrogen fixation. I'm going to add my buckwheat, so I'm going to pull up some more carbon. I'm going to pull up some more phosphorus and some magnesium and some, um, and some calcium. So I'm going to get a more balanced diet going in there. If I can balance the diet, then I'm going to be a whole lot better off than just feeding a whole bunch of carbon. And then I am going to break things down. Even with the tillage, I'm still going to break things down. And that's got to be my goal. Um, and so if we just talk about increasing the carbon from the root exudates, which mycorrhiza do, by the way, um, if mycorrhiza actually increase photosynthesis, and I'm not giving you the biology 201 because I decided that you guys are a little higher than that. So. Um, when you have mycorrhizal, when plants are colonized by mycorrhiza, <coughs> they have increased photosynthesis. And when they have increased photosynthesis, that means they're pulling more CO2 from the atmosphere. Which, so that's a bonus. The other thing is, is that by, they're also leaking more organic acids, amino acids, and carbohydrates out of the roots, which means that I'm getting more extracellular enzyme activity, which means I'm breaking things down more. So that's how your green plant works a little bit more. And we get better soil structure determines rooting depth. So you see what happens here. I get more things out here. The same plant is going to grow like this in a bad soil structure. And you all know that because that's why you till. So I, what, I mean, what I teach farmers who are not growing root crops is, is forget the plow. Let's use plants to do this. So I want to use plants to change from here to here. And when I can do that. So that's what the dip, that's, you know, gives you an idea. Mycorrhiza, too, your high speed transport, that neural network. 
your high speed internet is working better at optimum soil temperature, which means that all those plants that are connected, and especially if we're using companion <coughs> plants, then you can see what's happening right now. If we get that mulch, bit of mulch, which you still got on there, we get a slightly better temperature, then that means the mycorrhiza are working so much better, which means that they're transporting nutrients between plants better. They're taking the minerals out of the soil and moving them better. So here's your rhizosphere. Here's what it looks like. You've got your plants, your organisms, and your soils, and they're all together. And so you got to quit thinking about, I'm modifying my soil, I'm adding this plant. No, they're, they're a unit. Think about them as a unit. And so your rhizosphere is the most biologically active part of the soil. And here it is. You can see this root. This is a faba bean. You can see all the soil attached to the root. So your rhizosphere is your soil attached to the root, soil influenced by the root, okay? Um, and, and the root itself, because the root changes as well with the mycorrhizae and all these other things. So plant soil organism, every different, every different plant you put in the ground, that's why these mixes work. Every different species creates its own microbial community. Now this is where the picking comes in. Last year in the Pacific Northwest in our Sarah study, we picked wrong. And we inhibited the growth of our subsequent crop. We didn't inhibit it because of lack of water, because we had heaps of water in the spring. We inhibited it because we had allelopathy and we inhibited the growth of the subsequent crop. David Brandt, in his experiment last year, um, we, we planted, we replanted corn three times in a crop that had a lot of millet in it. And, and Dave goes, wow, this is the greatest cover crop ever. We have no weeds. We have no nothing. Yeah, and then we planted corn and we had nothing. And then we planted corn again and we had nothing. And then we planted corn the third time and we still had nothing. Um, it was awesome. If you wanted to kill everything, man, it was good. If we wanted to have something to grow, it was not a good choice. So that whole choice thing is really important. Um, and sometimes it's just like, you know, we thought we had it right, we missed. Um, one of my potato growers in Bozeman, who's a seed potato grower, we had a cover crop in there and accidentally Keith Burns put some mustard in. And he said, oh, no, worry, no worries, Jason, that'll be okay. Well, it wasn't okay because mustard bolted. And we had, we had to kill the cover crop. We had to take the cover crop off. In this case, we took it off and we, we, um, we uh, they have a dairy, so we put it to the dairy and we have the silage. But um, we had to take it off because we would have had mustard seed, and we didn't want that. We didn't want the seed. The other thing is, I don't want my cover crop to ever go to seed, ever, if I can help it, unless I want a self-seeding for the fall. If I want a self-seed and I want another cup bit of cover crop for the fall, then I will actually have seed. But otherwise, I want all my nutrients in the roots, and so as soon as I start producing seed, I start losing my nutrients to the seed and pulling them out of the ground. And I don't necessarily want that. Can you talk a little, about, a little bit more about lilopathy? We've got cereal rye, which potentially is a great resource for us. Yeah. We also have millet, which oddly enough grows well in the South Mountain here. Great. Um, how do we use those different plants so that we don't screw ourselves over? <laughs> Next season's um, Well, so the good news is, is that most of you are not growing corn, which millet will inhibit the next year. Um, if we get a, a good enough growth on millet, we can actually inhibit the corn crop. Um, wheat wheat um, has some issues um, with millet as well. Your cereal rye it really um, is really good at cleaning up dicots. And this is where you've got some two grasses there, right? That actually, um, I want to grow grasses when I grow dicots. Um, and the reason for that is, is that a lot of my grasses will inhibit other grasses. So my millets will inhibit my wheat. My, um, sometimes my rye can inhibit my wheat. But if I'm going to a, a potato or a carrot or some kind of a broadleaf, those grasses are great because they're not going to inhibit my broadleafs as well as they're going to inhibit my grasses. So what I usually do with my cover crops is if I'm going to a, if I'm going to a broadleaf, let's say I'm going to a potato the next year, I'm going to put a few more grasses in there to keep my carbon up. 
I'm going to modulate that with some of my nitrogen and my broadleaf so that I can balance that off. So I'm actually going to do a balancing act and I'm going to be heavier on the broadleafs um, if I'm going into a wheat crop. I'm going to be heavier on the grasses if I'm going into a broadleaf because I want, I know what I'm going to do there. Before you leave that, <clears throat> now the allelopathy I can associate with millet and I assume it's all kinds of millet. Mm -hmm. uh, if it affects wheat, then it would probably affect sugar kale. Yep. Uh, but is that in a subsequent planting or a tanning planting? Okay. I, see, now, we were talking about a fall cover crop where we put some uh, you would, kale and then took it off the hay the following. Yeah, that's nice. But so you wouldn't put millet with that. No, I would not. But you're, you're going to plant. You're going to plant fall. You're going to plant fall triticale. Yeah. So um, coming into your fall triticale, um, then that's nice because then you you have the opportunity to have um, some kind of a cover crop that has a bit of a legume or something else in it, so that I really get great yield on my fall triticale. And, I'm, and you're going to see my last slide is fall triticale in a in an age rainfall zone. I love winter crops in, in dry climates. I think they work really well. I'm going to come into that with a I'm going to come into that with a spring cover, because if if my cash crop is going to be my winter triticale, or because of the forage or whatever forage value, then I'm going to grow some peas ahead of that. I might even grow some of the um, some of my faba beans and things like that. I'm going to kill it, leave it on there. And I'm just going to kill it. I'm going to spray it out and not put it in or anything, just let it stand. And then I'm going to go into it, into my fall crop. I'm going to have to leave a window there because I'm going to have to stop it from growing too much so I don't take up too much water so I have a chance to infiltrate. Now here's the cool thing, is the more you do this, and Brendan will tell you this, the more that you do this, the more your soil structure is better and the more organic matter you have, the less need you have for a longer window between crops because you're going to hold so much more moisture and your roots are going to translocate moisture and there's going to be all these benefits. I mean it's kind of a hard thing to say because you know what happens is it's it's like when we start doing this two and two plus don't equal four anymore sometimes they equal six or eight and it gets all and we get you know it's one of these things where we start to build things. Um, disease. When we have diversity we don't have the same disease we don't have the same insect pressure because you know what happens. Um, I noticed that some of you are growing canola now. You have insects fly over and they're looking for the most beautiful resource patch, right? And that is the most intense color that they're looking for. If it's kind of messed up and the color isn't quite right, they'll move on. So that's how some of, sometimes we, we can use our cover crops to work. This is a, just a representation of what goes on. I'm going to just focus on this a little bit. This is how root exudates work, right here. Um, this is a very old slide from 1970s, um, done by John Pate in Australia. It's really important. <clears throat> you can see oats, we all know that oats are really good at nitrogen scavenging. That's because they like nitrate, they like free nitrate. So what are wild oats an indicator of? free nitrogen. So if you have a wild oat problem, you have excess available nitrogen. You just think twice about that. Um, you can see barley is slightly better than oats because it gives you, I've got a lot more of these more, are, are, are these more complex compounds, the amides <laughs> and the amino acids. Sunflowers, same thing, but they like nitrogen too, we know that. Beans, but look what happens when I get into beans, radishes and lupins here. Now I start to get four different nitrogen compounds being leaked out. Now I start to build diversity. So that's how you can build diversity by having beans and peas and things in your, in your um, mix. And then one of the things I think you can think of, you can put a bean in your, in your cover crop mix is by using mung beans or, because uh, the mung beans go really fast. Um, fava beans would work, but they're a bit big. We're gonna get some smaller seeded ones. You can see why the radishes work so well. Look at that. You're not going to be growing mini lupins here because your soils are just too basic for that. They want fives, pHs of fives in order to grow that. But look right here. White clover. What a surprise. Nitrates. That's why 
Sometimes when we grow clovers in between the rows of our plants, we actually have yield decrease because they are actually sequestering nitrates. If we took a cell sample and set it off for a nitrate and ammonium analysis of both of those, mm -hmm. what would we see? Which components of this? Um, the blue for sure. The blue for sure. Um, you want to do. Um, this is where your nitrogen, based on respiration, is going to pick up some of these amino acids and these ureites. Um, that's where your mineralization test is going to pick up more of those. Um, to actually look at amino acids is kind of tricky. Dean Martins did that. Um, you have to autoclave soils and do all sorts of things. But amino acid nitrogen is a very important part, component of the nitrogen. That's, that's you mentioned earlier, Rick That's right? better. All yeah, And that's respiration. Yeah, he's doing that. So I just wanted to give you an idea of what's leaking out of roots. There are carboxylates are leaking out. Buckwheat is a great one for that. Garbanzo beans doing that. Lupins have these acids that they're pulsing out. Iron and micronutrients, all those kinds of things. And it's all of the above. I mean, that's why we're going for biodiversity. We want all of it. You want to do everything that's in that list. I want all of it. This is another mycorrhizae. You can see the trees in there. What is this? Anybody? It's a weed. Red root pigweed, man. It's awesome. It's really mycorrhizal. <laughs> Highly mycorrhizal. Napweed. Incredibly mycorrhizal. It's taking advantage. The mycorrhizae give the weeds the advantage because they can move on to sketchy habitats and if they use the mycorrhizae, they can survive. They're actually using the mycorrhizae the way it was intended, which was to give you an advantage, a light, nutrient, water advantage. That's another reason we want to use the mycorrhizae is because we're water limited here. So let's use the mycorrhiza to get us more water, to access more of that water so that we actually can evade, you know, avoid drought tolerance. Because that's what mycorrhizas are doing for us. Julie, in, our, in our region, we've got probably occurring weeds. Very. Russian? Very. Russian thistle? Not so. But Russian thistle um, is, um, we actually, I, I, you know, remind me, send me a little email, okay? Um, because we published a paper in Weed Science uh, oh, quite a while ago on what weeds are mycorrhizal and what are not. Oh, it's already out there, so. Yeah, okay. but if you, if you email me, I'll send you the paper. I'll send you the PDF of the paper. Um, we think that affects our ability to buy control as well because um, when plants are mycorrhizally colonized uh, we know our biological control agents work better because they get more sugars in the roots so if we're using root feeders mycorrhizal colonized weeds actually succumb to the root feeders a lot better than they do if they're not and you can see why more sugars more everything going down there it's better for them so we actually have better kill so it was a biocontrol paper that we were writing at the time I was working with somebody who works on biocontrol so you can see how this is applied so you remember what I say about mycorrhiza greener more photosynthetic more carbohydrates more amino acids I mean, it's photosynthesizing more because it's shooting more stuff to the ground. You'll see this in wheat, too. How many of you um, are walking around looking at your fields with polarized lenses on your sunglasses? Anybody? Yeah. Because you can see the sugars. You can see how much better your forage is and where you're missing nutrients and things like that by wearing your polarized lenses. It's a little trick, but it works really well. And you can, so you can see nutrient deficiencies, especially nitrogen and stuff. When things are a little bit more yellow and a, lot of, and a little bit bluer, you can really see the differences. So how do you improve soil health and increase your effective organic matter? And I say effective. That's why you're looking at the Hurricane test. Build the diversity so we can have an agroecosystem that works at its optimum. So you're going to look to nature for inspiration. You ever look at a, a grassland? Is it one thing? No, if it's productive, it isn't one thing. It's a whole bunch of things. Ever look in the forest and look under the canopies? There's lots of stuff growing. We want to do this. The thing about the mixtures, and I thought this was really important, you get a lot of diversity, 
you still need to have a legume in there to drive the carbon cycling. This is how plants work together. Legumes. What are legumes? They have one symbiosis. Rhizobium. What's the other one? They're mycorrhizal. And in fact, you don't get good, you actually don't get good nitrogen fixation if you don't have the mycorrhiza, because the mycorrhiza are supplying the zinc and the moly and the phosphorus and the iron to the nodule so it can be fixed, so it can be fixing nitrogen. So you need to have both of those. So that's why having that legume in there is so important for moving the carbon and the nutrients and everything. There's your cover crop. We call this the Monet cover crop. Because it looks like a Monet painting. Um, that was created by a farmer in France for his wife. She was tired of looking at boring cover crops out of her window. And uh, so this was his gift to her that year. Um, this is also for honey. You can see we have bachelor buttons, cosmos, zinnias, um, uh, calendulas. There are some grasses in there. Um, we are using a mix very much like this in our potato fields. Um, so what we're doing, we're working with um, John Lundgren from South Dakota State University, who's an entomologist, and we are working at, we're putting strips in through our fields because we have quite big fields in the pivots. And so what we want to do is make sure that our predatory insects and our beneficial insects are being able to survive the whole time. Now, Brennan's doing some of that by having his companion crop right in there, so he's maintaining the insects all the time. What we're doing is actually putting these flowers around the perimeter and through because we're really trying to get things that are going to eat aphids. We want spiders and stuff. And we, we know that by disturbing the soil that we we don't have the spiders as much, but we're thinking that we can take advantage of some other things by having these these flowers. So I, you have these in a strip in a circular we, around the perimeter, but have you also we got them in pots of them? That yeah, so if we're growing, if our rows in our in our pivot, let's say our rows are like this, right. then about every it's about every 15 rows, 12 rows. We have a strip of flowers in between the rows. And we're trying to, we're trying to understand what length we have to work on to do that. And, and so we, we do this really gruesome thing. Um, we take, um, we take um, insect larvae, you, you know, just the mealworms that you buy, and we stick a modeling clay and we stick the tail of them with a pin onto, the, onto a little pyramid of modeling clay. And we put them out in the field in a pattern and then we leave them for 20 minutes and then go and collect them and see how many of them are eaten. Um, if they're chewed up, then we know how many predators we have and there's a relationship there. What is that flower that makes it possible? Um, you know, I, I, it changes from year to year. Um, last, well, last year, um, really, I just went to Stokes and said, what do you got cleaned up off your floor? And I took the stuff that they swept up that they have to give away because it's not certified or anything. Now, I don't really like that because I want a certified seed mix, but we put it in just to see what it was. And at that point, I mean, yeah, I mean, we're looking at $21 um, for, for that mix, $21 an acre. It wasn't that bad. I was expecting about $2,000. Yeah, no, it wasn't like that. We wouldn't have done it if, we, if it was that bad. It's about 7% of your acre. Yeah, but again, we're seed potato producers in this case, and so the other thing was, is we said, how much are we paying to spray all that acreage all the time? Is this under irrigation? Yes, that was under irrigation. So when do you actually mm -hmm. seed it? Well, we are going to, now that you're talking about irrigation. Because the problem I have, because I've been wanting to do something like this, but the trouble I have is I pre-irrigate and I plant my crop, and I don't water it until my potatoes are coming. So then I plant so late, I'm just afraid stuff will be flowering so late in the season, it'd be too late to do it. Well, we were trying to, um, we were actually trying, we got ours in late, we got ours in so late because we because of that, that we didn't get as many flowers as we would have liked. What we're trying to do right this year is put together a mix where we have constantly have flowers. So we're so trying to... Get that stuff to germinate and grow if you're not irrigating. Well, we're going to plant it in the spring, but we're going to have some seeds that 
that are going to go later so that things that take long are slower growing that are going to flower later in the season. See for the issue we have here in order to start the flower crop for the days, you have to water an entire circle just to water that 7% of that flower in the script. Yeah. And, you know, water such as so I got to think, so we got to think about that. Trying to establish that flowering crop within the parameters of how we're growing that yeah. crop. I just can't find an efficient way to grow. I can't water that whole circle just to grow those strips of flowers. Right, I get that. So I need to think about another way, which is where your companion crops come in, yeah. and maybe we could put something else in your companions um, that would give you a bit of flower later on. I mean, that, that's something to think for you. So the time that our aphids usually show up, which is the, the best of concern. Yeah, of course, yeah. Is late June, early July, that's when we start to see them come. And we would, I imagine we need predators there right about then. We do, so we need early flowers. My buckwheat will be flowering. Your buckwheat should be flowering by then. And see, I think your cosmos and some of your marigolds will be flowering at that time too if we put them in. Yeah. Well, you know what we were, we're going to experiment with this year is we're going to put some of those small seeds through the irrigation. Mm -hmm. uh, um, John Moss played around with that idea and said we're great past about the second tower. Okay. Those real, real small well, those first couple towers, he said, yeah, I was actually plugging that as nozzles. Okay, we don't want that. We were going to put the big nozzle. We are actually going to take the extra time to actually put big nozzles on. And, you know, I mean, it was just an experiment. I mean, we're going to have a try at it. Um, I'm going to move on, though, because otherwise we're going to get way past, and i got to still drive a bit. So um, I put this in. This is German. I put it in because I have exactly the same data from here, but sometimes when it's from somewhere else, everybody goes, oh, that's probably really good. Um, I don't know why, but this is, this is plowing. This is with the mulch. So you can see there's not a whole lot of difference between the mulch, and they're all different species there. You can see where we have direct seed, we start to have a lot more species diversity. And then when we have a pasture, the whole point is if you have livestock and you can afford to put a pasture in, you should do it because it's just going to stabilize things. If you're going to make a transition to no-till or organics, always go from a pasture. Always go from a cover crop. You just will not succeed otherwise very well. I and mean, it just makes it life easier. If you have livestock, your cover crop becomes a cute, and not only just the value from where the soil and the pollinators and everything, but now you have a feed. And you have a really good feed. And now I can justify adding some little, a little bit more money to my cover crop because I, I'm going to forage it too. So now I can be an awesome forage. Um, I put these in because we actually over sow pastures for livestock. I do a lot of that. And I do a lot of that around the world um, for dairies and for specialty. Um, and one of the specialties is ostriches. Um, ostriches are some of the hardest things to graze. They peck it right down to the bottom. They're like sheep. Um, they chew it right off. Um, they're really curious. So you can got to watch when you go in there because uh, and anything shiny they'll just peck it right off so you take your earrings and all your jewelry off because they'll just just yank at anything that's really sharp um, <laughs> and they're very effective at it um, they're very you know one wire and it's great you can get you can hold them in with a wire but um, they really chew the pastures down they require really specific <coughs> diets because we want those beautiful feathers um, we also want the leather. We want these animals in really good condition, like all of us want our animals in good condition. But what I'm saying here is that we can tweak pastures by over-sowing them and make them what we need to make them. Um, and we do it all the time and, and it works really well. Um, you've seen these grazing, dem these, these infiltration demonstrations. They're great. Use them more often. NRCS has a lot of them. Take advantage of them. They really tell people what's going on. This is, I, you saw David, David Brandt sowing his corn into his cover crop. This is with and without the cover crop. Um, this is in Nebraska. Uh, this is Gail, Gail Fuller's. You can see that as the crop senesces, we're growing living mulches here. Uh, this is subterranean clover. And you can see everywhere where the light's coming through the canopy, I have a clover. This is total microbial biomass, living the biomass, not just 
uh, dead, but only living, because we're using phospholipid fatty acids, which is what the PLFA stands for. And you can see here, this is rye. This is um, rye with broadcast nitrogen. This is rye that's being um, injected nitrogen, in this case, anhydrous. Anhydrous is terrible. Um, this is, is rape with um, clover. This is, um, um, these two here are two cover crops that are in a bag that everybody can use. Um, and this is continuous corn. And what you see here is continuous corn is useless. Um, here are our cover crops, they're great. Here's rape with, um, with clover, very nice. Anhydrous, and we just see anhydrous over and over again just killing off our microbiology. Here's a, one experiment we did in the Pacific Northwest, and we, um, our water regime is a little bit more than yours. We're in a 10 inch rainfall zone, but um, you can see here, I grew um, wild type desi chickpeas in between the wheat rows. So I interceded. Um, now, the wild type chickpeas, you, you have to understand that chickpeas or garbanzos came from Iran. High altitude, dry, cold, all those things which you actually have a lot of in common with. Um, I use the desis, which are wild type. They're the fern leaf. They're highly mycorrhizal. They give off a lot of acids, so they pull in a lot. They're going to give you a lot more calcium, phosphorus, some of the micronutrients. Um, you can see the wheat's in there. We didn't spray herbicide because we couldn't, um, but we didn't need to. Uh, the wheat yields, the average wheat yields for our county were 34 bushels of dark northern spring wheat per acre. I was at 40. I had no fertilizer. Um, and uh, my protein was 14.2%. So I didn't take a hit. I made protein. There's nothing wrong with this. Now, the only thing that was wrong with it was that we actually could have harvested the garbs, um, and we didn't. And the garbs were actually worth a whole lot of money this last year. Is that spring Yes. Desi, D E D E S I, and actually, um, I had I uh, if you Keith Burns actually has that in my green cover seat because he bought a whole container off a grower of mine from Saskatchewan, Canada, to bring them in. Um, we people just haven't been growing them; they've been growing the big kabulis because they're more for export and not wild type. But these ones are small. The thing I also like about it is the seed is small, so it means that we can use them like a pea. They're the size of a pea. Yeah? What's your seeding rate on that? Um, my seeding rate on this one was actually uh, 22 pounds per acre. Because we thought we were actually going to take it, we have a crop, but we, um, we couldn't set the combine. We could have set the combine lower. Um, when we harvested them, um, we're going to have a great cover crop because we shelled out most of the of the garbs that were there, so I'm going to go over there and look and see what we're growing now. But um, you know, we'll see. It was, it, but it really worked. The nutrient density. We actually measure nutrient density in the grain, and this grain was right up there. I mean, it was good for you. Zinc levels were over 35 ppm. I mean, that's a really good indication of what we're doing. Um, this is what we're seeding into. So these are our winter pastures for dairy cows um, coming into the winter, and this is in South Africa. Um, I'm doing this in Wisconsin. Um, we're going to have a big experiment in Michigan um, that we're starting this spring, looking at how we can tweak pastures and, um, and increase uh, productivity. Healthy soil, uh, this just, that's just what we were seeding in there. Um, the bottom line comes right here. Milk production was up by 7%, calcium content was up by 4%, and the cows had less problems with mastitis and liver lesions. And also, we actually had more forage than we actually had cows suddenly. Thanks. Um, all these things, connected, 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 connected. Just remember, everything is connected. Okay, so here is water use efficiency data. I want you to look at that. There's wheat stubble. There's soybeans. Common vetch by itself. Mixture. Whoa, what happened? This is the woo-woo factor. This is where everything's connected and they're sharing water, they're sharing nutrients, and we're not using the water that we were using 
just by the veg by itself. Because it's sharing. Now, this is a relative growth. This was at eight. And we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen species in there at a cost of twenty-four dollars an acre. That was at that growth phase. Now let's look at it again, mix two, which is very similar, but it's at stage nine. You can see where we're using a bit more water because we've grown it out a bit more. But still, it's not like when we had an individual species. And you've saw, seen these. There it is. I just explained to you what's happening. We're not having water use. We know that we're sharing. You know, think of what's happening there. Roots are weaving themselves together like this, right? They're touching each other. We have hydraulic conductivity. The deep roots that are pulling deep water are sharing with the shallower roots. There's your connectedness. The mycorrhizae are plumbed, have plumbed all of them together. And ones that are suffering are getting from ones that aren't suffering. And that's why all this works. And, yeah? What's the approach you take in deciding how much of a seed, not just how many different types, but how much to put in um, <laughs> Some of that is just based on money, my budget. Some of it is based on where I am. If I have a really moist environment, if I'm in a subhumid environment, then I'm going to put more, I'm going to put, you know, half a pound and a pound of, of a bunch of stuff in there. Um, some of it is going to be uh, based on if it's big stuff or little stuff. So if I want, if I'm putting big peas in there and fava beans and things like that in that are going to be really tall, then I know that they're going to shade other things out. So I might be picking a bit differently. I know that the fabric beans are going to have a big deep root early in the season. Um, so that's my big, let's say that's one of my bigger rooted things. My brassicas, like in that case you saw Ethiopian cabbage, whom you dwarf Essex rape. I know I'm going to have a big deep root in there. So I'm going to put about two or three pounds in there um, of that. Um, I'm never, oh, and by the way, I am never, ever, ever going to exceed a pound of daikon radishes, ever. And I recommend nobody do that, because you'll find that it creates some other issues because um, of the an enormous amount of biomass that's in there. It will use a lot of water. It does give you back the water because of the mush and everything, but um, it creates um, a bit of a toxic environment when you have too many of those, and they're not being eaten up. And, yeah, and it's really not very nice. Um, <clears throat> it depends on what you want to affect. It depends what I want to affect. Always, affect, always does that. But I always am going to pick deep roots, shallow roots, that kind of thing. I'm always, I'm looking at roots too, and the effect. I mean, it really is a matrix. On, I, that, on that Greek seed website, they've got typically full seed rates, what would cost to put on a full seed rate, and then you ratchet it yeah, and, and I, that's why I like the calculator, because you can just play. And some of it, you know, I can show you, I mean, at some point, if you want to just email me, I can show you what, you know, what some of our mixes look like. You know, half a pound of this, a pound of this, you know. Roles of genetics. This is all the same soil, seeded exactly the same way. This is all the turf grass, and you can see the difference. Genetics are important. Um, I'm going to pick this crop or this one. I don't want that one. These are wheats. These are winter wheats. And I don't, this, this variety of winter wheat I like. Look, I've got good top growth and I've got excellent root growth all planted at the same time. I want that. You need to ask your people, you need to ask the people that are growing your seed. Say, hey, what does this look like? Um, and there is a lot more that we need to do. We need to work on this a lot more. Um, we have moved beyond food scarcity. They would tell you that we haven't, but we actually have. I mean, most of my growers in South Africa are net exporters. Um, there are people starving there? Yes. It's not their fault. Um, it's a distribution problem. It's, I mean, if you want to control people, how do you do it? You starve them. It's easy. 
Yeah, you just starve them. And when you starve people, then they'll do whatever you like. And that's what we're doing. I mean, I, I, I work in countries where, where the government starves their people. Um, this is what we want to do. We want to have, I work with Shepherd's Grain. Um, I am their scientific person. And this is what we do. We are marketing our flour based on quality. We do nutrient density on every batch of grain that comes through. We are looking at, and we can put on the back, strontium, beryllium, um, cobalt, we know all these micronutrients and we're telling you what's good for you. I mean, this is the percentage of nutrients that are in there. We want high zinc. All of our stuff right now, our growers, we're recommending a particular way of fertilizing so that we make sure that everybody is over 30%, 30 ppm zinc in every batch of grain that they're growing. Right now I've got growers that are down in the 20s, that's not good enough. We have to get that up there. I want over 40. And when we put the cover crops in, we start to see that happening. I don't know why. Um, we start to see great roots. We start to see great crops. We start to see this. You think an aphid stands a chance in there? No, it does not. They, we, by reducing the amount of insecticides that we use, and especially when we're in a potato situation, we can start to actually take advantage of spiders and beneficial insects and then start to not have the problems. When you're standing on your ground, you need to think about the fact you're standing on this, the rooftop of this other world. What are you doing to that? This is Mark Sheffel's first time at growing winter triticale. And he was, I took his picture there because he was pretty proud. He was chuffed that day. Because we were going to harvest probably around 55 bushel winter trip off rain-fed soil, and, you know, uh, he grew that on six inches of water. We were pretty proud of it. But what it said there, and the way he was looking at that, is he diversified his rotation. Everybody said he was crazy. Oh, you're going to lose money. You're going to do that. He's growing like five crops in his rotation. But his bottom line is way higher. His base income is now higher. He's created wealth for himself because of it, because he always has something. He has five different crops in his fields every year. One of them is going to make it. He's going to make money on at least one of them, if not more than one. We're, what we're doing is risk management, and I think that's really important. We've increased the number of winter crops in there. We're adding canola now. Um, we're pulling in some of his covers. Are going, he's growing a cover crop before he goes into his winter cereal. Um, and. Not only do we have the diversity, but we have everything functioning a lot better. I mean, this soil, this, this soil is cycling nutrients. His, you know, he's pulled out his nitrogen IV and, um, and not using half the amount that he was using before. I mean, I, I, I just can't say, I mean, the data is there, the scientific data is there, the anecdotal data is there. Um, you know, what I encourage, and I'll just go back to that one, what I encourage all of you to do and I know there's a few farmers here, there's a lot of NRCS people in that, is make sure that people are making informed decisions based on science. Pictures, yeah, I mean, I see how many people, citizens come up and go, hey, look at these pictures. Yeah, isn't this great? No, where's your data? Don't, and if you're gonna make a decision based on, if you're gonna just grow something because you like the pictures, fine, then make sure you have a control strip. That's all I ask. Do a control, make a comparison. You want to try something? Sure, have a go. Just make sure you have a control that you can compare it with. I know that farmers aren't going to make replicated experiments, so that's okay. If it's just for their benefit, make sure they have a control so that they can make a, a really informed decision. Um, and, you know, it's just... Um, and, that's, and there are tests out there, and we're trying to develop tests for farmers that they can use on their own ground so that they can just make a, they can actually have a better informed decision. The Solvita test, um, they can do respiration. They can actually do their own respiration on their own field under their own conditions and look at what nitrogen they're mineralizing, what phosphorus and sulfur they're mineralizing. It's a good little idea. Um, there's lots you can do on your own. If you don't want to pay for somebody to do a test or interpret a test, then there are some things that you can do on your own, and, and we're 
you know, we're opening the black box now and we have techniques that will help you understand what's going on in your soul from a soul health perspective. I think um, we're still a little behind, but we're catching up fast. Um, and I think you're going to have a lot more ideas so that you're going to be able to promote your growers and you're going to say to farmers they're going to have a lot more opportunity to send their soil somewhere that can actually have an informed decision. Um, and it, I mean, I think it was pretty obvious there. I work with a lot of no-till farmers. Um, we just threw soil tests out the window. We don't bother with them because they don't make sense to us. Because our soils are so biologically active that the soil test means nothing to us anymore. We do grain analysis and we do the Haney test and we do soil respiration. And that's how we decide what we're doing. Yeah. Is that helpful? Yes, it is. Um, what is that in English? It's phospholipid. I don't know if the English is going to help. Uh, it's phospholipid fatty acids, and they're essentially it's membranes. So every cell membrane in every living organism is made up of lipids, and the what makes that membrane um, is unique. So. Um, a bacillus organism has a very different marker than a pseudomonad, which has a different marker than a rhizobium. And um, <clears throat> the level of saturation, so you hear the term saturated fat and unsaturated fat. Um, saturation means that you're kind of stressed and every, you haven't opened or made any double bonds in the membrane so you could leak enzymes out and things like that. So that's what that means. So we actually do ratios of saturated to unsaturated things like that. Um, I think I think you saw from that rye, I mean, we can see very clearly that anhydrous ammonia is a bad thing, and I see that over and over and over again. <clears throat> um, when we were looking at those soils where the plants were being stressed, they were constantly being fertilized, and they were st still looking like they were starving. When we saw the microbial biomass that high, I mean, we understood what was going on there. And, and we could even make a decision. And then we even knew that because we didn't have predators that we had bad soil structure. So then we dug a pit and we looked at things and we made a decision. And we could see then that we had compaction at the four inch level and that we needed to do something about that. So we've taken four steps. One of them is subsoiling. Um, we've got radishes and we've got you know, various cover crops in there. Um, we're trying biotillage and we're trying, you know, all the other things that we could do to see, you know, we've got even a different rotation in there to see if we can bust up the, com the compaction. But it allowed us to make an informed decision on what we, what our problem was. From your travels, how long does it take before a farmer will begin to see the economic benefit of having switched to this new approach? Huh. Um, that's, that's something that I see. Well, I hope, I know that, I mean, that, so I tell you what, I mean, I believe that farmers ha need to create wealth. I mean, I, I, for my own company, I need to create wealth. For farmers, they need to create wealth. I mean, I, when I, I see one, there was one paper that's been published that's been going viral in ecology about how organics, even though they are yield, lower yielding, there's so much more ecology benefits that we should just go for lower yielding and sacrifice yields so that we can have ecological benefits. Well, I just disagree. I mean, that does no farmer any good. Yeah, but you're not. I mean, it, maybe you will. Um, if you got paid, and yeah, I agree. But it's got to be about your bottom line. It's got to be about the fact that I just don't want to make a living. I want to actually create wealth. I want to be able to have all, you know, I'm not talking about being a billionaire or anything like that, but I think I need to be able to create wealth. And I think that's what all of our goals should be. And... Um, so in my mind, when I do this, it's all about creating wealth. And I think what we've done is shown that. For example, um, my recommendations for growing a wheat crop, and I've shown it for the last two years now, um, is that um, I'm at half the nitrogen and half the inputs that all the other farmers in the area are at, and I'm still out yielding them, and I'm making protein. Are they going to change? Yeah, they are. They don't know quite how, and I'm going to have to hold their hand a little bit, but that's okay. I'll do that. Um, that's why these peer groups are important, too, is because they allow everybody to talk to one another and go, okay, so if we're going to implement this, then how do we start doing that and learning? I mean, it's about coaching. I don't see myself as doing anything else but coaching a farmer in to make a transition 
And because that's a hard thing, and you're doing it by yourself in a community, you better be strong-willed in order to be able to overcome all that crap that goes on in a community about how you're going to fail and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so I do, I coach farmers on how to make that transition, and I mean, my goal is to make them more money the first year, and my for sure goal is that I'm going to maintain your yields and I'm going to maintain your income over the first three years, and after three years, I'm going to build your income. I and think we need to look at the economics of the different two. So we can talk about the yield reduction on it. If we cut our inputs in half and only lose ten percent of our yield, we're still gaining. Well, that's exactly right. So what happened was, is for example, I had one farmer that did do um, companion planting. He was one of the first ones to do companion planting with corn, and he lost, you know. So the first year, he said, well, you know, I probably lost 10% of my yield, but I didn't use anything. So when I did my bot, when I, when I actually was net gain. So, I mean, it's the same thing when I do plots. One of the farmers said, well, I want you to pay me for that because you did a check. And I said, yeah, okay. I said, so here are my numbers on my check. My check made $99 an acre. What did yours do? Well, this year, all the farmers I worked with lost money in the Pacific Northwest, almost all of them, that did their own thing. <clears throat> and all my plots and all my tree and all my acres on their own farms made money. I broke even or I made money. My checks, they go, oh, you need to pay me for your checks because they didn't make any money. I said, yes, they did. They made $99 an acre because I didn't do anything to them. I just grew a crop and they all made protein. It's like, oh, how do we do that? And I said, well, you know, we didn't spray it. We didn't do anything to it. So to check. So, I mean, I, I think your point is really important, is that and when I say make an informed decision, I want you to, to actually have a big spreadsheet. When I'm in Argentina, every farmer, the first thing you do when you go on their farm is they hand you their book. And their book tells you everything that's gone on in their farm from the time they've owned it. And I've been on farms that have books that are handwritten from the 1600s. It's beautiful script gold on the side of the book, it's all leather bound, it's beautiful, and the handwriting is exquisite. And they know, and they do that. Every farm I go on to, they hand you the book. This is what I've done. And David Brandt, the reason that the banks go to him right now, they go to him and they say, okay, David, you need to mentor these three farmers because I'm gonna, I'm gonna take their farm away in the next year if they don't do something. So David Brandt coaches them now. The reason, the bank give him premier interest rates and they give him more money on his operating loan if he wants it because they know he's more profitable. But he's documented that. You can see his organic matter increase. It's been incremental, but if in, in his no, in his records, he can show it going up like that. He goes to his landlords and the landlord says, well, so-and-so is offering me more money for that same land. I think I'm about switching. What do you think about that, David? And he shows them. He goes, okay, here's your land. Here's where I've taken it. Here are your yields when you started. Here's what it is now. Here's, uh, here's the money you owe me if you switch. Because I've changed your soil. I've made it better. And they go, really? I mean, I have to pay you? And he said, well, yeah. Here's where you started, and here I where I am now. No. You owe me this much. They go, oh, well, I didn't realize that you'd done so well. Here, have it for another year. I mean, and that's where we want to go. We want, I want every farmer to have that book. I want them to show that. I want them to be able to go to the bank and take soil health to the bank and say, this is my farm. This is my soil health. I'm going to be more profitable. I'm going to be more, uh, I'm going to make more money than the next guy because I have soil health. That's my ultimate goal. Maybe I'm altru too altruistic. I don't know, but I'm going to have a shot at it. So the idea of hold your breath for three years. I don't want you to hold your breath. <clears throat> I'm not going to lose you money. That That is not going to happen. And if it does, I profit share with all the farmers that I work with. I got skin in the game. If they lose, I lose. And I think that makes me more competitive because, well, I'm super competitive anyways. I mean, I come from a family of Olympic athletes, so we're all really competitive. And so, you know, I like to put my money where my mouth is. So I'll profit share with you, and we're not going to lose money. I mean, maybe we're going to have a drought year or something like that. If, as long as it's something I can't do anything about, okay. But as long as if it's something I can do something about, then let's do it. I mean, 
<coughs> and so far I haven't lost money. So in the three years, we, we've got one more year to go. This is our last year in our three year trial to actually putting out sort of recipes for our, our growers for Shepherd's Grain in the last three years. My first year was a bit dicey, but I never lost any money. Um, my second, this past year, I made money over everybody. This third year, I expect to be just right on task. So I don't, I don't ever want anybody to, I don't want to put anybody on hold. I can't, nobody can afford to do that. I can't afford to do that as a farmer. My husband would freak out if I did that. You know, I mean, we have to make money, you know, we have to make money on our own farm, so we can't take that. All the farmers I work with are active. I mean, it's not like they all have heaps of money and they're just playing around. Right. But, you know, you, you see, even if you see the investment, when you do the bottom line and you actually work out what I didn't spend, I mean, I, I see people all the time. When I show them my spreadsheet, and they go, that can't be right. I mean, I've had people there that go, that can't be right. And I've had to show them all my receipts and everything so to, just to prove that I was right. In the potato world, I, there is a, a time of transition. It's hard yeah. to just jump right into that initial profit. You have to earn the right to get to that increased profit. Right. See, there is a transition period. But I think that for that, there is a transition period, and that's about the time you build your organic matter. But I think that depends on your rotation, too. Brendan. It depends on what, how much you're willing really to commit to it. Right. And so if I could, you know, if I could get you away from potato cover crop, potato cover crop, and put something else in there, I think I could take you through that transition well, better. I see what you're not also helping. They want to dabble in it. They want to pull out certain components of it. They sure that they have to buy in 100%. Yeah. That's what they want to do. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. But that's, I mean, I think that's where we have to go. So we've been having a one-way conversation. Everybody's been listening, but um, are there any questions? I'm wondering if, from what all has been said today, part of the change that we have to see is that, or I should just ask, can we do this large corporate scale with multiple farms where people don't get off the tractor and walk the land? From what I've heard today, the intimacy with what's going on in that particular place is the educational investment. Yeah. So how, I just asked the question, how can we do such huge scale things where we're not even a part of that community? Um, or could part of the transition mean we need more farmers doing more of this kind of work? Because <coughs> um, it's complex. It's complex. We need farmers in our communities that um, are successful in it that can help coach others. We need our, our, our NRCS agents to understand this more and, and be able to really coach people through it as well um, without, with understanding too that one size fits no one. I mean that's the key. One size fits no one. So it makes it much, more, much harder because it means I have to deal with every individual. I can't just give you a blanket and go, <clears throat> oh yeah, here's your Betty Crocker box, you know, go after it. And I mean, that's where intensification of farming has been really successful, is because it's been, here's a box, here's a bag, here's a, here's a jug, go after it. And this is going to take a lot more mind work, it is. But in the end, it's going to become part of your, the way you do things, and it's not going to be, it's not going to be that hard anymore. I mean, the farmers that have been successful in it, tell me that they're having more fun than they've ever had in their whole life right now. That farming was really boring, and now it's not boring anymore. It's really fun. They're seeing their kids come back because it's not boring. It's fun. Um, because there's room for them, too. Because you need so much more management and more thinking and more, more people advising that, you know, you, you, can, you can have your children have them on task at researching stuff so you can all use it. So now you have four agronomists in the family instead of one. What's wrong with that? Now you're using brain power. I mean, and I think that I hear that over and over again about how the family has come into it more than, than, than it was before. And I think, you know, so you have to ask yourself some of those goals. Is, is one of the goals to have my family more involved? Well, this is going to involve them more because they're going to have to have, you're going to need more resources 
and more brain power to do some of this. So they're going to have responsibilities in thinking about stuff. And I, I think that's part of it. Um, I think, too, that yes, we can do it on a large scale, but I think what's really fun about this is that, <clears throat> and I'll give you an example. Um, I, with the dairy consortium that I work with in South Africa, <clears throat> in the one that started, there's eight farmers. And um, the one farmer embraced it, and he's gone nuts on it. And he's sort of like a Gabe Brown in South Africa right now. But the cool thing about that is, is that in the same amount of land, he's going to build another parlor, milking parlor. So he's not increasing his scale of land. He's more efficient on the land he has, and he can actually build another milking parlor if he wants. Because right now we're mowing. Right now we're wasting energy mowing pastures so they don't get past it. Because he doesn't have enough cows anymore. Before he had too many cows for with the land he had, and now he doesn't have enough cows for the land he has. And he's also down. I mean, he, he jokes about his nitrogen IV, but he's pulled out his nitrogen IV because he used to be using um, about 1,000 pounds of nitrogen an acre over his annual system. And now he's down to 20. So think about it. I mean, oh, he did, I, we joke about him. He said, are you going to take a holiday? What are you going to do with all the money you have? He said, well, I got a new one of this, and I got a new one of that, and I got a new one over here. And, I mean, and he said, now I'm going to put the money together for a milking parlor because I think I can have another small milking parlor, and I think I'll make that one an organic milking parlor, and I'll separate these, these wedges for that. So <clears throat> you can see on the same amount of land how much better we've become. And that's what I think this is about. It's about having the land that you have and being more efficient on what you have and being able to manage it better. You know? Because it's a big job. It's a really big job. But I think we can do it on a large scale. I mean, I think we've proven that we're doing this on a large scale. Um, most of the farmers that I, you know, when we started weren't working on a large scale, and now they're all working on a large scale. I mean, they took 100 acres and played with their 100 acres and proved it to themselves and then went crazy. And now I don't even do anything with them. They phone me and they go, I think I'm going to do X. What do you think of that? I said, well, what is your tissue test? What did it look like? Oh, it looks like this. Okay. Well, then, have a go. You know? I think I can cut back on this because I'm here. I think I can cut back on this because I'm here. I mean, I don't believe that we're ever going to get rid of, of fertilizer. Um, I think it's about augmenting your biological fertility with your chemical fertility. And I want every tool in my toolbox. I mean, I do. I'm never going to walk away from a crop because it's got bugs. I'm going to spray it. I mean, I'm going to try not to. But if I'm going to lose my income for a year, I'm going to spray it. Sure I am. I would think that over time, when you implemented this, that the farmer would actually have more time because he's do. got the soil working for him instead of being well, out there putting nitrogen on. Well, I mean, even when they start no-till, they have more time. And then they start doing this, and they have more time. But then they spend all their time on the cover, green cover crop seed calculator. <laughs> I mean, every spare minute playing with, well, what can I have here, and what can I have here, and oh, I could do this, and oh, I could do that. And now they start playing with, what, what can I grow? So now they go to the next level and they, yeah. But it just means they have more time to manage too. Yeah, it's all those things. Any other questions? So, I've got a question I'd like to ask you. You talked about the allopathic effects of the millet with the wheat pollen. I know a producer that's doing that and he's got kind of a dead zone, dead time period between when the millet is harvested and the wheat is sown. Uh, would there be a way to do milk with a companion crop or wheat with a companion crop that would help alleviate some of that, or are you always going to have that effect of the millet on the wheat? No. In fact, you don't have any allelopathic effect of the millet if you have enough other stuff in there. So in other words, if you grew something else with your millet, um, like an, um, if we could put something lower in the millet um, and still harvest it, like seed harvesting for seed, okay, well then that's not going to happen. <clears throat> um, but if we could, and but the millet, I presume, being a summer crop, is going to be harvested what? August? Maybe a little later. Okay, so beginning of September. So we still have a chance to maybe grow something to alleviate that effect before we come into the wheat. Or is he planting winter wheat right after it? Well, he's waiting. He's waiting about six weeks. What we're thinking about doing is having a diverse mix, which included millet perhaps, but also in the 
the second of the week, put some other stuff in with the wheat. And then harvest it and then just sure. just clean it out. Oh yeah, that's fine. You can put um, in that case to get rid of that allelopathic effect, um, you don't put a brassica in there. Because that will intensify it. Um, it, it intensifies it because the brassica has some effects as well and so you end up compounding them like you have a synergistic really killer effect it's great I mean if you want to get rid of weeds and stuff it's awesome if you want to get rid of some other things it's fabulous but if you want to grow something in six weeks time don't don't put a brassica in especially in a dry climate if you were wet, it wouldn't matter because you'd leach it and your decomposition would be so much faster. But in a dry climate, everything is slowed down because of the lack of moisture. And so you, you end up with, we end up in dry climates with a whole lot more allelopathic issues than anybody in a moist climate does. And we need to understand that. Yeah, no, I mean, we, because we, our, our residues stick around a whole lot longer. So we're, we're leaching those compounds out a lot slowly bit by bit so we continue to have this sort of prolonged chronic effect whereas the guys in the moist climate will have this immediate you know acute effect of it and then it will be gone and we just keep having just the little bit of a little pathy for a longer period of time <clears throat> so I like so with the millet you put a legume with that and the legume will, will mitigate that effect